Okay, so this is the competence stage, stage four. And this is where, uh, this is really about power, a child exerting power to achieve, to, to be able to do certain things. David, can you mute? Thanks. <laughs> power to achieve certain things. So if uh, parents only selectively mirror the child, selectively uh, gives the child feedback. Okay, it's fine if you exert your power over here, but it's unacceptable over here. This child learns that, okay, wait a minute. And this is also on the, the maximizer jumbler side. I have to figure out how I get this feedback, this positive feedback. So this child becomes a compulsive competitor as an adult, right? Always trying to achieve um, and always trying to do better. So if, if they get criticized about a specific area in their relationship, then they might say, you know, you are never satisfied. Whatever I do or uh, accomplish, whatever my achievements, you aren't satisfied. You always want more and better. So that might be the complaint as an adult. But this person as an adult is drawn to, uh, let me just write that down, sorry. So the competitor, So on the maximizing side of things, the jumbler is drawn to the compromiser, right? So this person never got any of their efforts to uh, achieve anything validated at all. There's no encouragement. There's no motivation to perform. Um, I've seen this with parents who've got uh, a very... A capable child and then maybe as a child who's got a severe disability of some kind um, and then they the, the, the child that actually achieves things they don't want to make a big fuzz of it so this child feels like okay no matter what I do uh, it doesn't it doesn't matter I get no feedback or on my achievements and efforts so this is the minimizing side and the square I call it the small goes uh, under the heading of small square. So these people find one another. So you are compromising, never trying to achieve anything, letting go, uh, uh, compromising in terms of the relationship, meaning you let the other part you know, win, whatever you want, that's fine, that's good, all good. So there's, there's no pushback on any level. So next phase is concern. This is where we start making friends. So we start connecting with people. It's really about learning uh, to, to care about other people. So you learn to make friends. And if your parents um, uh, don't allow you to make friends and don't let you go, they're overprotective, right? They're always holding on to you. Uh, they don't invite your friends over, anything like that then you can become a loner as an adult. So this is on the square side of things. Uh, and this person will be drawn to the caretaker, which is always looking out for other people, right? The jumbler, always concerned about other people. I've seen this side of it, the jumbler side, the caretaking side. It's people who um, grew up in, you know, in, in, in a minister's home where it's always about other people, always focusing on other people, never about us. So wh whatever it is, uh, the, the other person's needs comes first. Always about other people. These people find one another as adults. And the last one is intimacy. And this is in our teen years. So 13 to 19, more or less years old. And this is where we develop our ability to build relationships. So this is really about love, romantic love, and our sexuality. Right? Uh, to build a, in, a, a, a healthy sexuality. So because this is where all the hormones start 
activating and all kind of things like that. So if you've got parents who, um, who pull in the reins too much, so hold you back too much, criticize, very critical about any kind of relationship or sexuality or anything like that, ashamed about um, sexual organs, you know, and this, um, this can vary, like maybe your, 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 one of your parents uh, walks in while you are masturbating and you are severely shamed about that. It's, it's the biggest crisis ever. And uh, even the, the religious angle, Christianity, uh, for example, gets brought into this. So there's a lot of shame and guilt around it. You know, this, this person becomes a rebel. Right, so I will push back. I won't do what you say um, at all, ever. I'm just gonna push back. So this this rebel, it's got the rigid boundaries. Funny enough, so the rebel is really about rigid boundaries. This is a square sign. Very rigid boundaries. My way. This is the way I'm gonna do it. I'm not gonna listen to you at all. This person is attracted to the conformist on the jumbler side so uh, always always um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for open to whatever other people need uh, compromising on very different uh, all different areas of their life um, and this these parents um, put pressure on their child to to be a model child like a, a achiever um, performing well at school being an example on everything there's a lot of pressure around that and they learn that only if I perform well if I do the right thing then I will be acceptable that's that's uh, the part of me that will be acceptable other things won't be acceptable maybe my needs my wants uh, they, they aren't acceptable that's the message message the child gets. So just to, to be very clear, going into all the details of these different stages, for me, doesn't matter so much. If you find it interesting, you can research it. You can read uh, Keeping Their Life, Love, Love You Find by Harvard Hendricks and learn more about that. To me, that's not as important. And just understanding that there, there will be a square sign depending on how you respond and how uh, specific needs were addressed and a jumbler. Fight flight in Imago, they, they call it minimizing and maximizing. And usually these two people will find one another. They will find one another. They will be attracted to one another. Uh, let me see, there's a question here. Uh, can you be a jumbler at the one theme but uh, a square at the other? Yes, that does happen. It does happen. So maybe your parents... Um, the, well, let me say this uh, first and then I'll go into it. So usually for squares, there's no attention to the needs of the child. So the needs never get met. Uh, if it's the identity phase, no matter what you do, your parents never mirror whichever identity you try. So there's usually zero feedback. There's zero feedback uh, from the parents in any positive way. It's consistently uh, unavailable. It's consistently uh, not given. On the other side, it's up and down. Let me do it like this, up and down, right? So there's some feedback positive and negative it's up and down so this is why this person learns the square side learns well i have to uh, suppress my feelings my needs i have to have very strict boundaries rigid boundaries uh, and why this person goes like well let me figure out because it's sometimes there and sometimes not so I, i'll keep on trying different things i'll go bigger and bigger to see where and how i can hold on to that connection that i feel
So if you understand this, um, you will be able to spot it in your relationship dynamics and understand, oh, this is what's going on. And back to your question. So uh, you will tend to be one or the other, even though maybe at one stage you reacted differently. Uh, in, in conflict, conflict will indicate uh, that will be the biggest indicator for you which side of the spectrum you are on. But it might be like, uh, let's say in, in terms of the exploration phase, you were more on the square side, right? So you don't want to be close because you fear that I will be uh, smothered, hold, uh, someone will hold on to me and I will no, lo no longer be able to explore. Um, or, uh, uh, and, and in another stage, let's say the competence stage, you were more on the jumbler side. So maybe your, um, your efforts were sometimes acknowledged and sometimes not. So on the, uh, comp in the competence phase, that's where you are. So depending what the conflict is about, that will depend, uh, um, determine which side of the spectrum and how you react to the specific conflict or need. Uh, does that help answer that question? Please uh, let me know in the chat if that helps. Uh, so that, that might trigger different things. So it helps to understand, oh, I'm acting this way. Uh, why? Be curious. And also, well, what you might find interesting and valuable to understand, you may be your parents got divorced when you were seven or six that'll have an impact that'll have a major impact on your developmental uh, um, needs being addressed or not maybe you uh, then stay with your mother and now she's trying to cope with uh, you know providing for everyone and all the stresses regarding that while raising you if you stay with your mom so suddenly there's not as much attention to what you need. So maybe suddenly, instead of being there and on and off, meaning usually it was on this side, there were some, now suddenly it's all the way to this side. There's no validation, no attention to my needs because your mom just doesn't have the capacity. Um, then you develop more of a coping mechanism on this side. So this is really about survival instinct. So all of this, all of these experiences from childhood become part of our um, survival instinct, our survival instinct, meaning what do I have to do to survive? What do I have to do to uh, try and have my needs met? So that will be on the jumbler side. What do I have to do to try and hold on to what I can get? And the other side, how do I suppress and deny my needs if you're on the square side? If I don't need anything, I, I can't be hurt. If I don't hurt, if I don't feel anything, you know, I, I also cannot feel the pain or the disappointment or the rejection. So that's how we learn to survive. Okay. Now I want to close that chapter. I see there's another question. question two. Those two sides are quite polar. Is there any framing of a healthy upbringing in Harvell's model? Um, I I'm not sure I understand this question. Healthy upbringing means your needs were addressed about 60% of the time. So I I'm not sure where they get that number. But because uh, we are so robust, we are built to be robust and to survive as humans. Uh, if, if our parents get it right 60% of the time, we're all set. So it's not about being perfect at 100%, but just being there most of the times, addressing our needs and giving attention to our different stages of development. Um, that helps us develop that that secure develop securely through every stage getting what we need if it's attachment it's some emotional security if it's exploration it's the freedom to explore 
then come back and feel that connection and then being able to go back out. Like I mentioned this morning, competence, being able to try things, to exert power, to do things that might be uh, scary for the parent that you try and do that. Um, for example, let me give a little example there. If, if you are a parent that's afraid of public speaking and the embarrassment, you might discourage your kid to uh, partake in a debate at school because it triggers your insecurities. Now you say, no, no, don't do that. But your child wants to try and go and do that. That's an example of that. Okay, let's see. Uh, another question, is it only parents or the entire family dynamic whom you are living with? Yeah, all your caregivers. So it might be uh, parents, it might be maybe you spend a lot of time with your grandparents uh, for, for um, practical reasons. While your parents were working, you stayed with your grandparents. They will have an, uh, an impact. Um, and other significant people in your life it might be a teacher as well that can um, help shape that in different ways and today we also will be we'll be talking about socialization which is another element of this um yes oma opa tani sisters yes uh, uh, all the siblings definitely also shape that so if you do self-development work before getting married, can you minimize the effect of these attachment issues in uh, your future relationships? Yes. Yes, you can. Understanding this helps a lot. Addressing, if you know well, for example, like I mentioned, my parents did get a divorce. That'll play a role. So understanding, okay, suddenly some of my uh, needs weren't met. So... I started, you know, I was in the competent, competent stage. I started competing at school, but no one was there to um, support me in any way. So um, that was suddenly gone. That'll have an effect. So if you can do healing work there, it'll help massively. It'll determine how healthy the partner is that you find attractive. Let that just sink in for a moment. The more work you do in understanding yourself, healing and growing before you go into a relationship, the healthier partner you will find attractive because there's less issues to form part of the unconscious agenda. And some of the issues will never surface outside of a relationship. So you won't be aware of some of these things until you are in a relationship and then suddenly they surface. Okay, more questions. Um, are there people who get 60% typically attracted to another type in this model? So you mean someone who's got a more healthy, um, uh, whose needs got met, are they attracted? To no, not in my experience. Someone ma might uh, seem likes, like with this, um, the stage that I mentioned here, the, the intimacy. Uh, oh, sorry, it's not sharing. There. Uh, or with the concern, sorry. <coughs> this caretaker might seem like the healthy person, right? Always looking out for other people, helping, supportive. Um, you know, I... I had a big messiah syndrome, meaning I wanted to rescue everyone that I, uh, that I went into a relationship with. So I had a lot of this. This is more on the jumbler side, right? So um, as, as a whole, I'm more of a square, but here it manifests as a jumbler. It's more of a, a, a jumbler concern or a uh, role that I have there or the way that it manifests in my relationship on that side um, sorry this people this person struggling to come in and out is distracting me a little bit um, oh so so that's on can you be like uh, healthy and then be attracted to someone that's unhealthy uh, not in my experience no it all might look like one person is the one with all the issues and the other one isn't. 
but usually that's how it manifests you are maybe the caretaker so you feel like um, you will be loved and you are valuable if you only focus on what other people need or you're the compromiser um, you know in the in the intimacy stage you're like you know you're always giving um, you're always focused on what the other person needs it seems good but it's not it's not healthy because you are denying whatever you need focusing only on other people because of that developmental glitch that you experienced all right let's see if there's any more questions before i move on Healthy will go for healthy. Yes, that's how the theory goes. Um, all right, more question. How do you know that your partner is healthier? You are healthier. That's how you know. You are healthier. Um, I like to... Um, <laughs> what can I call this? tease myself a little bit because uh, I married someone that's 10 years younger than me so it means I did 10 years of more personal development and healing work and uh, <laughs> still ended up with a lot of uh, conflict and relationship dynamics that's very challenging because of that and that's why I say yes some of the stuff you can heal so I grew up in an alcoholic home I went to nine uh, primary schools. There's a lot of things there that indicate some issues. So mine, like I mentioned before, is on the, I was more on the square side, minimizing. Um, I was the invisible child. So whatever I did wasn't seen or acknowledged. And uh, I was uh, still attracted to someone subconsciously when I met my wife. Having dealt with a lot of that Messiah syndrome th um, issues that I have trying to rescue someone that, that desperately needs me I think uh, that became a lot healthier but other stuff then only surfaced within my relationship my marriage in the relationship dynamics and to be very honest and frank um, having to present this class again I explain these things to couples every now and then I don't like going too deeply into the detail because it can become overwhelming and confusing. And most couples then use it to analyze their partner instead of themselves. Um, but having, uh, you know, uh, to present this, this, this class, I'm like, I can once again highlight the dynamics between me and my wife, how we actually need to help one another address those unfulfilled childhood needs. And I can see places in my own um, behavior and reaction to my wife, like, oh, okay, which I'll explain now um, when I go into socialization. Um, so I'm still learning and discovering things that indicate uh, where I have to grow and heal. Um, and especially where I have to grow to help my wife heal. It's like, oh, okay, I'm not actually helping her address that. I'm failing her in a uh, in a certain way. Sorry. All right. Let's move to if there's no more questions around that. I see someone says, "Wow, yes, it is wow." When you when you start learning and understanding this, is it's really wow. So the attraction to another person is really a very intelligent process that unconscious agenda is very very powerful and it can be quite overwhelming and and sad in a certain sense because uh, about 50 percent of people get a divorce and you know those who stay together they go into that para parallel relationship that i explained earlier which is the invisible divorce so it seems like only about five percent of couples have a healthy thriving relationship it's that rare and it's because we don't uh, we don't put in this kind of work we don't learn these skills early enough we're not equipped especially in that intimacy phase teenage years um, 
I don't know about any one of you, but I didn't have a proper example of how a relationship should work. So in intimacy, to see how, you know, my parents um, uh, interact with one another. How do they show affection towards one another? How do they connect? There's no example of that, right? And none at all. So also, I uh, I was um, you know, big into christianity and church and things like that so sexuality was bad it was seen as very very bad and dangerous and so i also learned to suppress my sexuality which took a lot of work for both my wife and i to reawaken our sexuality within our marriage because she got the same message of course so let me use that to transition into socialization um she, when preparing this morning, um, there's a lot of a lot of things that I can cover here. I can I'm I'm gonna see how far I get today, uh, but don't worry, I'll delve into more of it next week if we don't get to cover all of it. And I also want to mention now that uh, next school term, so by the end of October around there, I will be doing another series. And the questions and comments I, I got about the attachment theory um, made me feel like maybe I'll do a whole series only focusing on that, the attachment theory and how that shows up in your relationship dynamics later on. Um, I think that can be very powerful and helpful because it, I love it when things get simplified so they become useful. Once again, that's why I don't want to go too deeply into theory because when it it's too complicated it's no longer useful so we need to sim simplify it enough that it becomes useful and we can actually practically apply it in our day-to-day <clears throat> -day and our relationships okay let's talk about socializations just a drink of water so we are born and come into this world whole uh, that's supposed to be a perfect circle, but even the AI couldn't correct that. Um, meaning that we we can engage with the world with our emotions, our thoughts, our senses, right? All our senses and our bodies, which means action. We can move. When we are able to engage with the world around us with all of this, this, this is when we are whole. But as we grow and develop, we get different uh, messages from society. So the messaging around all these different parts of ourselves can be direct, right? So a little boy might hear that he's not supposed to cry. So his emotions are, are, are criticized right it's criticized because uh, for his parents or society it's unacceptable that a boy be that emotional so that gets <coughs> criticized so it can be direct like don't cry stop that crying don't be angry things like that it can be subtle so indirect in the way that he observes that little boy observes his parents and he sees like Oh, no one cries. No one shows any emotion. When someone else does, it's talked about in a negative way. So I'm definitely not going to show any emotion. Because uh, I want to stay connected with my parents. And here's the big phrase I want you to realize. All of these parts of us that make us whole when we come into this world. Able to engage and connect with the world. We'd give up any and all parts of it to maintain a connection with our parents or our caregivers. So we'd rather give up a part of ourselves to stay connected to our parents because they represent life. Without them, we will die. That's, you know, in, in, in the infant stage, it's very obvious and literally means that. But... The perception as we grow older is the same. So we'd rather give up a part of ourselves to remain connected and acceptable to them 
um, because it represents staying alive. Okay, <clears throat> so let's say you get a lot of messages messages around a certain part of yourself. So to use that example again of the little boy, he gets told um, emotions uh, is a problem. You shouldn't be so emotional. And also, what's all this stuff about art and music and things like that? So he gets negative messages around his emotions and his senses. All right. <clears throat> then he develops like this because he learns that okay those are okay but these oh, what am i doing <laughs> these aren't this is not okay so this is how this person develops and this is now how he engages with the world uh he's a thinker so he's maybe his career in, revolves around thinking solving problems at work and also he likes all kinds of sports he likes to be active so he's always out playing golf um, riding a mountain bike and things like that but when it comes to emotions doesn't feel much doesn't even know what he's feeling when it comes to his senses he doesn't understand art you know you'll say things like that that's not for me i don't get that that's silly um, i could have drawn that picture you know <laughs> Things like that. So not intact uh, in terms of senses. Um, around senses, I can also say it can. It, this is this is also part of our sexuality is over here in our senses. So as a little child, you might uh, see your parents get very excited when you pull on your ear and you say ear and like oh fantastic. And you say no, it's fantastic. And then you take your penis in your hand and you say pee pee and like no 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 don't touch that. Don't touch that. We don't touch that. That's that's not good. And we get different names for it, like whatever. Uh, instead of saying, you know, that's your penis, we get all kinds of different names for it. And I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with having a certain word for a sexual organ, but the words often is, uh, you know, it's it's shaming in a certain way, and it kind of, it serves to remove. The reality of this is a sexual organ this is what it's for so when a child for example gets a little boy gets an erection you know he gets criticized for that don't touch it what's going on what did you do you know a little messages like that so also that that's uh, sexuality and sensing part gets subdued in that way <clears throat> So somewhere else, so let's let's draw that picture again. Action, thinking, emotions, <laughs> emotions, sensing. Somewhere else in the in the world, a little girl gets the message quite differently, right? Your emotions, feeling emotions, being expressive, laughing loud, crying, getting angry, all good. No problem if you do that. Um, we like the, that you uh, draw, you're picking flowers, you're smelling the flowers in the garden, uh, you dance to music, you know, you, you close your eyes when you hear something beautiful, you cry, and all of that's acceptable. But running and jumping, climbing trees, getting dirty, no, we don't want you doing that. Also, don't talk back, don't have an opinion. Or the, the, the most subtle one that I get around this is, um, don't worry about that. We'll take care of it for you. We'll do it for you. So don't think. You don't have to think. Um, um, girls get this message often and, and the youngest children get this message. Now, your ideas are stupid. You know, shut up. We'll sort it out. So back to the question, does your siblings also play a role in shaping you? Yes. So what happens? These two people find one another. Right, and what happens? They get a sense of wholeness because now all of these parts can be uh, accessed through the partner. So, what you're really go saying is, Oh, the boy goes, Oh, my lost emotions, my denied emotions, there they are. 
I have access to them again. I can feel it again through my partner. And now this is so beautiful for you to see, to see these emotions. Or uh, the little girl says, wow, you know, you're active and playing and you do all these things. I will attend everything and be there with you and support you and all of it. <coughs> all of this gets this gives the sense that I'm whole. To quote, um, what's the movie from by, by Tom Cruise? You know, you complete me. That you complete me. That's the sense we get. I found you. The person that completes me, that makes me feel whole again. This is why. And I've simplified the dynamics to, to kind of illustrate the point. But this is a very common dynamic uh, for men and women. Exactly what I've drawn out here. This is why I'm using this example as well. But it can be very different, right? You can have someone who, who's overdeveloped their emotions and thinking and suppressed their action and senses. For example, and they find someone who's on the opposite side of that, um, making them feel complete. So all of this <coughs> uh, makes us feel like we found someone that's perfect for us. So what happens then? What happens then? Uh, you, because you are attracted to to someone that makes you feel like you you are whole now, it feels like bliss it feels fantastic but then gradually as you enter into the power struggle part that we covered in i think session two with creator um, as you move into that phase you like you give your partner the same messages that you got right this is also referred to as, as the super ego because you still have the voice of your parents inside you you still carry it with you so if uh, let's simplify this message. So the little, little boy said, don't, the message was don't feel, right? To simplify it, don't feel. What does, his, what does he tell his wife when she's emotional, crying or angry? Right? He criticizes her. You feel too much. Why does he do that? That's the thing that uh, drew him to this person in the first place. And that it, it represents a part of his lost self. Well, because as a little boy, he learned that emotions are dangerous and bad. So now he's projecting that onto his partner and then criticizing it. Now he's got a problem with that. So uh, this is exactly the kind of dynamics that my wife and I have. So I... I had to learn that it's okay to be angry and express that to my wife. Show her that I'm angry. Uh, she won't think I'm a bad person, uh, a bad husband, or that it's any kind of problem. It's okay because uh, emotions aren't bad. They're not a problem. It's the way that we express them that, that we need to develop and mature. right? So I had to learn to access my emotions the, the good and the bad, to simplify that. It's not the way I view emotions. Uh, so those those of you who are on the Clarity Quest, for example, will, uh, will understand that a little better when I say that. But um, <clears throat> when you learn that your emotions are a problem, you also struggle to have access to joy. So my wife helped me to have access to joy, to laugh, to get especially excitement, so messages that I got as a little boy, I remember clearly when um, my brother and I, we'd, maybe we'd go to a new place and we'd be very excited and we'd start getting loud and pointing and shouting and, and my father would pull us, you know, kind of um, pull us closer to him and say, uh, in Afrikaans he'd say, Muni mark of your next you know, <laughs> which doesn't even make sense as a sentence, but we won't, we won't supposed to show that this is exciting to us. It's a, it's bad. So okay, don't smile, don't get excited. So my wife helped me to access that again. So your partner actually, if you realize I'm triggered, I'm criticizing this because of my own issues. When you realize that, then your partner becomes a gift to you. If you don't. Then your partner has to double down. So if I never get angry, express any anger, 
my wife has to feel everything for the both of us. So she gets double and triple as angry. Right? Because I'm not sharing that. Um, the same happens with, with thinking. So if I'm always criticizing my wife's ideas and uh, uh, thoughts, right? So I become the voice. I simulate the voice of um, criticism that she got around thinking and having ideas. She's uh, coincidentally the youngest by six years, so her closest sibling and a girl. So a lot of, lot of issues around you don't have great ideas. Don't think that's stupid. No, we're not going to do that because her siblings were much older already and had different ideas of what's a, what is a good idea, what, what will be fun to do, for example. So if I then keep on criticizing that, um, I don't help her develop that. But if she also doesn't step up and risk doing certain things and executing her ideas and thinking up what she'd like to do and then executing that, then also I have to do all the thinking. So I have to come up with all the ideas and, and then she can criticize that. You always want to be right. We always have it to do it your way. So uh, she has to also learn to bring her ideas to the table and execute that. So we had to learn this language as a couple um, so I have to pay attention and ask, okay, those were my ideas. You shot them down. What's your idea? Right. To allow her to also come up with something instead of just um, criticizing the thinking because her thinking was criticized. I have to express how I feel, uh, access the joy and the anger, show excitement. Otherwise, she has to do it for both of us. And then I can say, well, don't be so emotional. That's too much. That's how the projection plays out in the relationship dynamics. <clears throat> okay. What's our time? We've got a few minutes. Any questions around this so far? Please put it in the chat if you've, if you've got any, any questions. None. Okay, so whatever the message messaging is that we got as children, we internalize that and that becomes part of the superego, meaning we carry that voice with us. Even when our parents are lo no longer with us, you know, around or even alive, we still carry that. So we still have that voice telling us, oh, oh watch out, don't feel, uh, don't think, to simplify it. Right, don't think becomes in the relationship for example <coughs> uh, you want everything your way or you always want to win be right it can sound like that this is the dynamics that plays out right so once at one stage, you felt you make me whole. Now it's like, oh, wait a minute. My subconscious reminding me that emotions are a problem, so I should criticize your subconscious reminding me that thinking is a problem, so I'm criticizing your thinking. I want to add one more thing, and I think I'm going to pause then for today. If... If all of this gets criticized right so the criticism comes from of course your caregivers but uh, it can be the town you grew up in right that reinforces the messaging your school reinforces the messaging uh, your church reinforces the messaging so you get it from many different angles and places um, but if, if none of your parts are allowed to be expressed, right? Um, I want you to understand this, this little image is to, to illustrate. This is kind of like a balloon, right? If you press down on one part, the air goes somewhere else. So other parts overextend and overdevelop. Okay. 
So back to this. So if all of it gets criticized, right? If all of it gets criticized, then you are wounded in your core because the message is don't be, don't be. You shouldn't be here. We never wanted you. You're not welcome. That, that means you are wounded in your core. And to go back to attachment, that disorganized attachment style where there's abuse and all of this, this is what it can look like if it's about the way you interact. So you shouldn't move, you shouldn't feel. No sensing, no thinking. Basically, don't exist. Your existence is a problem. You are wounded in your core. And you need to do a lot of deep and hard work to heal and learn how to access all of these different parts of yourself to be able to engage with the world and with a, in, in a relationship. <clears throat> okay, if there's no other questions, none at all, then that's it for today. I'm going to give a few more moments if there's any questions that you want to put in the chat. Uh, oh, here's one. Do you think there is any evolutionary benefit to this nature of finding the missing pieces conflict due to differences? Hmm. Uh, I don't know about evolution, but it helps us because, you know, if you think about the cavemen, the, these things weren't relevant. It's about survival. So we were very primitive in the way we engaged with the world. It's really about survival. So um, minimizing and maximizing fight and flight were necessary. But in a relationship um, that gets triggered and we feel it, we, we deem it as a threat when it's not. And that's where, why that's um, triggered. All those survival instincts are activated because the part of our brain that's responsible for that um, the reptile brain, uh, it doesn't have uh, time. So it's not as if it realizes, oh, wait a minute, these feelings are from my childhood or that voice I'm hearing is, you know, my dad's voice and he's not here. It's got no sense of time. It feels everything is now and that's why it reacts that way. But I think um, in terms of a bigger picture, and that's why I feel it's so amazing and wonderful and magical that this is the dynamics it invites us to wholeness so i need my wife's emotions and connectedness to her senses to fully engage right i wasn't as wounded in my sensing part was because of music being able to um, uh, connect on that level with my sensing part but i need her to help draw that out of me and draw that back, uh, you know, help me access that to engage with the world fully again. But um, just like we choose a partner that we um, that represents that part of ourselves, she will also then criticize my emotions, right? So I shouldn't feel too much. That's uh, uh, um, not because she's got a problem with emotions but because of the relationship dynamics that play out so i have to learn how to express those emotions uh, in another way uh, practice it right and it's not like she'll directly criticize it necessarily it means that there's not always room for my emotions right because um, her overdeveloped emotional awareness doesn't leave much room so that's why i say it's this teamwork and that's uh, in terms of evolution i think that's beneficial to everyone because you grow back into more of your wholeness because of your partner yeah grow together into deeper meaning yes another question can we do a parenthood series on this sunday yes i want to do that as well around the attachment definitely but that will probably only be Next year, let's see if we can make it happen uh, this year. But um, 
I think it's realistic that part of the Relationship Masterclass series will be around fear and food. How to help your kids heal when you come to Better Insights. Yes. Yeah. <coughs> um, that that projection, that, that sense of, wait a minute, um, this is a problem, will play out in your parenting as well. Because if I learn that emotions is a problem, it's dangerous. When I see it in my kids, what will happen? The same thing will happen. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Don't, don't feel too much. At one point, I might feel, oh, I'm whole. I've got access to my emotions. But then the same thing can happen. I can be selective. Yes, the joy and the laughter, that's fine. You can feel that. But don't feel the anger. That's a problem. right? Only feel this. Be a nice little boy, a good little boy. Never angry, never anything like that. Um, so I actually had a conversation with my son in the car because he wrestles and sometimes he gets very frustrated, angry and, and cries when it doesn't go that well, when he's struggling in a wrestling match. So this morning I told him, told him that it's 100% it's to feel angry and sad. I do too. But in wrestling, uh, it doesn't mean that you are then allowed to stop the match because then you automatically lose the match. So you, you can feel it and whatever. You can be angry, be sad, but still engage with the world in, uh, instead of withdrawing or using that as a, a, a reason not to engage. So that's the way that we have to, as parents, navigate the emotional world for our kids, right? It's a, um, like I said, if we get it right 60% of the times, they will be okay. Because our needs as humans, as children, it's, you know, it's so complex and layered. No parent can get it right all the time. There's just no way. Uh, the child doesn't necessarily even understand their own needs and dynamics. So the best that we can do is when we realize something is to do better. So when you know better, do better. Okay, people, hope that uh, gave you a little bit of insight into your own relationship dynamics. I'll see you next week for the last class in this series. All right, enjoy your day. Bye-bye. <laughs>